Good evening, listeners. On this, uh, the 6th of November and also Daylight Savings Time, we are Casey and Hannah coming to you with our 18th installment of the Non-Existent Story, a storytelling, story listening, story guessing podcast where this uh, episode, Casey will present, will be bleh, will be blank and presenting two stories, uh, one already published, one which she has made up, and I and you as well will be listening and hoping to guess which one is which and keep our lead on the Hannah team for <laughs> for winning at guessing. So, Casey, take it away. Okay, so I'm I'm deviating a little bit from our customary format, which is to give a narrative summary and then a an excerpt of a text and because these don't really follow conventional narratives and I tend to be drawn to more kind of fluid stories anyway um, I'll just be doing kind of a compressed versions of of the originals we'll say um, into about a page and a half but the theme for this week could be many things I'm gonna call it for now memory houses hmm Houses of memory, memory. I like memory hyphen house, memory houses. So that is that is the uh, the generic central theme or or guiding concern of both of like these it. stories. Cool. All right. Well, I I will begin, and because I'm doing it, uh, because I'm in, I'm not doing the summary excerpt. I'm gonna just do kind of a, a background, uh, an ambiental sound background, a soundscape Ooh. for both. All right, so, yes, it sounds good. <laughs> so, uh, I will begin. Any questions? Proceed. Okay. September, and here I am. I am returned to Ireland. I have never been before. My grandmother and grandfather had come, separately and later together, from Waterford on the southern coast. Before they immigrated, my grandmother and grandfather had known each other as people in small towns know each other, through recognition and snips of gossip, but without much thought on the matter. Their subsequent marriage was, in a way, the result of their mutual nostalgia for the time when they knew each other only as a vague image of so-and-so's son or daughter down the street, and a scattering of other receding half-shared images, a view from a certain hill on a summer morning, the names of the roads, a cantankerous old lady with vicious dogs whose house they both avoided. The preservation of these memories brought them together during their voyage across the Atlantic and then bound them together in the New World, where, in trimesterly acts of pious self-sacrifice, they would generate their large family of foreign children who had never seen, as they had seen, a sunrise in this moor or the bright red door of the pub on the corner. I remember I came to visit my grandparents one day when I was five or six, and the shutter on the door opened and a face, framed by the square peephole, peered out from the shadows. They always kept the blinds drawn. I was quite frightened, because I could not tell if it was the face of my grandfather or of my grandmother, so alike they had grown, imitating each other's expressions, sexless bodies morphing into one another after 70 years of constant company. But I should not say such things about my grandparents. No doubt they loved me in their devout and tribal way. I would like to say that I came to Ireland to fulfill the wish of my dying grandmother, but had she expressed such a wish, it would have only repelled me. No, I came here to look for the little house on wheels. It was my grandfather who had spoken of it, and only once. I can barely remember the other things he would say. His voice is faded now from my memory, but I remember the one phrase... In the lovely town of Lismore, there is a wee little house on wheels. When I was very young, I imagined it a, a miniature Victorian mansion rolling about upon roller skates or the rubber tires of an automobile. Through an upstairs window, I could see a beautiful girl that I fancied at the time in a frilly nightgown, reading by the light of a kerosene lamp. But in other dreams, it would hurtle down a hill, bumping against rocks, and I would hear screaming coming from inside the wee little house on wheels and wake up covered in a stinging sweat that soaked my clothes and burned my eyes. So I came to Ireland to find the house on wheels. I was certain that it existed, and I was right, though of, co though of course what I found abandoned in Wicklow was nothing like what I had imagined. That night, an evening breeze blew across the port of Wicklow, through the open hangar, and into the open window of the mobile dark room. 
At first I thought it was a gypsy caravan, a rotting old wooden mobile home, heavy blinds still drawn tightly shut, a rickety stair on one end and another still more rickety at the back, where I could still dimly make out the chipped printed letters. Nicklethwaite Photographer. I stepped onto the wooden step and, dissolved, and it dissolved into dust. I tried to open the door, but it was bolted from the inside. And it was only after resolving to pry open one of the windows that I could glimpse within. Piles of album and paper, brittle as eggshells, rustle against one another, grazing against the stacked sheets of tinted glass and scratching against cameras that expand like an accordion around empty vials that once contained bromides, iodides, and silver nitrate, the faded prints pile up. They're all copies of the same face, and I gaze at it, and he gazes back at me like two sleepwalkers in different dreams, as if my autumnal self-awareness, captured now and at 3.47 p.m. on April 17, 1868, contained all of my ancestors and all of my children, or as if the papers that I stood among were the fallen leaves of my family tree, and I must gather them or burn them. That night I dreamt of a woman in the wee little house on wheels. At times she was a stout matronly sort of woman, hard and dour, and at others the girl in the frilly nightgown from my youth. Her sleeves exposed raw red hands as she moved frantically about in their portable dark room home, holding the glass glass plate. Taken just before he left, he had gone, she had photographed him, and he was gone. She was hurried, she had only ten minutes to develop the image before it was lost. She had so few minutes, and her hand trembled, and the plate was so fragile. The plate must be fixed just so. The water poured over it just so. It must be heated over a candle for long enough, but not too long. Just hot enough, but not too hot. And then the varnish had to be poured on so smoothly and evenly. She moved her hands as he had taught her in a smooth rotation, expanding circles, pulling the album and papers out of the solution of egg white and silver nitrate and pressing the fragile print against the warm amber-colored glass, taking it out to catch the afternoon sun that burnt her eyes, repeating the process again and again for years until at last the image was worn off and all she had were the piles and piles of album and prints of his face. Glossy ruby-toned prints of the same face over and over, varying sometimes in color, sometimes tinted, others not, accumulating her album and prints as the horse pulled the caravan through again at last, the town of Lismore. Ooh. This is a perfect story for November. It's, yes, it's, it's, uh, tried to go with a uh, seasonal appropriateness as always. I have a, a pumpkin candle so in the back. I don't I know. Can if you almost, can, I can almost, I can almost smell. smell. <laughs> If you if you had if you were drinking a perhaps a a white pumpkin mocha, that would be even better. <laughs> uh, um, a venti white girl. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> ah, but it's so late at night for that. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? I don't believe so. Um, no. Okay. And just they're they're kind of uh, fluid stories. So yes, very fluid. Okay. Story two. Yes, I'm ready for it. Yes, yes, I'm ready for story two. It was Albert who found me the job. Smothering a smile, he told me of a, quote, generous and impulsive patroness, the aunt of his fiancée, who could help me. And later he told me that she had ordered her house flooded in accordance with an architectural system invented by a man from Seville, who had also flooded another house for an Arab desirous of compensating for the dryness of the desert. She also liked my books, and that summer she invited me to the flooded house on the condition that I knew how to row. The house, like a human being, had been obliged to perform all kinds of tasks. First it was a country house, later an astronomical observatory, but, this, but as this telescope that they had ordered from North America had been sunk to the bottom of the sea by the Germans, they decided to build a greenhouse in the courtyard until finally Miss Mar Mrs. Marguerite bought it and flooded it. The ferryman rowed me slowly up the avenue of water, the width of a street, and bordered on both sides with banana trees. The front of the house was covered in vines. The water flowed in from underneath a closed door into the great courtyard with an island in the center. Of those days, I always remembered the little voyages we would make around the tiny islands of plants. I would row, perched, perched behind the immense body of Mrs. Marguerite. If she gazed at the island for a long time, there was a chance she would tell me something. 
but not what she had promised to tell me. She only talked about the plants as if she wanted to hide her thoughts amongst the shrubbery. I would grow tired of hoping and would lift the oars as if they were hands, bored of always counting the same drops of water. But I already knew that, during other little voyages, I would return to discover, once more, that this weariness was a little lie confused with a bit of happiness. And so I would resign myself to wait for the words to come to me from that other world, almost mute, with its back to me, sliding away from the width, the force of my own aching hands. I imagined that the husband of Mrs. Marguerite was buried on the island, and that that was why she had me row her around it in circles, and why she would summon me on nights when the moon was out to go around it again. Then again, the husband could not be on the island, since according to Albert, she had lost her husband on a cliff in the Swiss Alps. Moreover, the ferryman had told me the night I arrived to the flooded house that he and another worker had filled the fountain themselves in the middle of the patio with earth, so that afterwards it would form an island. Then again, it is also true that the great stained glass window that rose into a dome seemed to enclose a silence in which the dead are preserved. But then I remembered that she had not been the one to order the building of the stained glass window. It's that her immense body, surrounded by a naked simplicity, tempted me to imagine a sinister past. And if I let my memory wander freely, I stay with this first, Mrs. Marguerite, because the second one, the real one, the one that I knew when she at last told me her story at the end of the season, had a strange manner of being inaccessible. After the fateful trip to the Swiss Alps, she finally began one day, when I had lost all hope of hearing her story, she arrived to an Italian town sad and alone. That night she looked out of her hotel window and saw a fountain, reflecting the moonlight brightly that she suspected it's reflecting the moonlight so brightly that she suspected it to be a mirage, but afterwards it seemed to her quite innocent. The next day she went for a walk. She saw an old man with a watering can in his hand, and when he tilted it there appeared a vaporous skirt of water murmuring at her. I must not abandon the water, she thought. And then that night she did not go to look again at the fountain, but when she saw the water in her water glass, illuminated by the faint moonlight from her window, she imagined that the same water from the fountain had contrived to follow her and to place its secret in the water she had drunk. And she realized for the first time that one must cultivate one's memories in water, that water elaborates upon what is reflected in it, and that it receives one's thoughts. In cases of extreme despair, she said, uh -oh. one must not hurl one's body into the water, but rather one's thoughts. From the moment she began speaking, I felt tremendously anxious. My guilty thoughts flitted past, along with the idea that there was no time and that it was not worthwhile to think them. And, she, and as she spoke, the water presented it, itself to me as the spirit of a religion that surprises us in different forms. And sins in this water had another meaning, and its meaning didn't matter very much. This new, second Mrs. Marguerite attracted me with a strangely sublime force that she exerted from a great distance as if I were a satellite. But I still inclined towards the first Mrs. Marguerite, the unknown one, the simpler one, the widow without a husband, the one upon whom my imagination could more freely intervene. My two Mrs. Marguerites confused me considerably, and I vacillated between them as if I did not know which of two sisters I should prefer or betray nor could I merge them into one in order to love them both at the same time. The next evening, she summoned me to an homage to the water, she called it. It was nearly nightfall, and the sound of water poured, pouring was much louder than before. I rode us both into her bedroom, where, along the whole length of the wall, I saw hung innumerable watering cans of every shape and color. They received water from a great glass receptacle suspended from the ceiling like a light fixture. We docked at her bid frame, high enough to keep it well above the surface of the water. We took off our shoes, and Mrs. Marguerite climbed onto the bed, which was very big. As I lit the candles and let them floating around the bed, she picked up the phone and ordered the watering cans to be turned off. There followed a deathly quiet. She ordered me to bang, to bang the gong twice, which was terribly uncomfortable, as I had to crawl about on the edge of the bed to avoid touching her legs, which were quite large and occupied much space. One by one, the candles began to go out. Without her telling me, I scrambled onto the boat and untied the rope, and the current carried me away from the bed and down the hallway with unexpected force. I remember the voyages that we used to take around the island, when Mrs. Marguerite seemed to me a different person, and I was overcome by sadness. 
I was destined to find myself only with one part of other people, and moreover, for very little time, as if I were a distracted traveler that did not know which way to go. The next day I found a note from her. She thanked me for my friendship, promised to help me financially, but insisted that I must leave tomorrow. And in the postscript, if by some chance you write a story of what I have told you, I only ask that you end, at the end you put these words. This is the story that Marguerite dedicates to Joseph, be he living or dead. Is that the end? Oh. Okay. That was very difficult for me to follow. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Yes, if you, if you have questions. Uh, I do have questions for the second one, just uh, for me and for my listeners who hopefully are not quite as confused as I am, but they in case they are. Mm. Uh, the, the wine is helping me get more clarification. It tends to do that, yes. Yeah. So there are either two Mrs. Marguerites or one, or all of them are imaginary. Or there's one Mrs. Marguerite and the two others that were talked about were kind of imaginary. Um, they're not exactly imaginary. I, I think well, what he is uh, doing here is... Um, he, he he meets a person that he doesn't know very well. And for a long time, he doesn't have anything to go on. And so he just imagines things about her. And that's his first version. And then she tells him her story and he gets to know her better. And that's his second version of her or his second getting to know of her. So he knows her in two different ways. The kind of version that he had imagined because she was so mysterious. And then the version that, that she reveals, um, which is somewhat insane. And he has a he's attracted to both but in different ways and so i think maybe what what's happening here and it's it can it can happen in i think anyone's relationship with anyone else is that you only see certain facets of people and maybe you see suddenly unexpectedly a second facet of a person that seems to contradict or that you don't like as much or that you maybe find more fascinating but less um, likable or accessible or easy to deal with than the first version that you originally knew. And so you have coexisting in your head two versions of a person, and then what do you do with that? Right. So I really... Like I said, they're, they're about they're memory houses. So both right. stories are about, about memories or perceptions or how you might remember a person. Right. And how I would think about them uh, after your description of the second story would be as conduits of memory ah okay i think um that's but that's just me maybe um so so when you first said uh memory house as inspiration uh my first thought was there's a kind of uh technique that people will use to remember things where they'll if you if you tell them let's say a long list of items that are unrelated to each other Mm -hmm. remember what they are. What you are meant to do in this practice is to picture like a, a building or an area you're very familiar with, maybe like a street. And as they start listing these items, you kind of plot them in that mental image of this blue canary is at the first door. And as I open, there's a closet to the left and inside mm -hmm. the closet was the second item on the list. And it's a canary. And then I close that door and I move on to the kitchen, which is the next room. And that's where the giant lizard is curled around a rose, which is the next image I need to remember. And so when they're asked to recite the list again in perfect order, they're able to do it because they've compartmentalized it within mm -hmm. this memory house or structure. But that's not how the story uh, ended up going, although there's a, a brief Kurt Vonnegut short story that kind of makes fun of that technique, uh, which is very cool. But that's aside. So the first one, well, this is why I say it makes me think of conduits of memory, because in both cases, the narrator is outside of the story and is more given the, the burden of the memories of other people to, to mm -hmm. translate to the audience. Um, so the first one is uh, a grandchild, a grandson, I think, um, whose grandparents were from Ireland. Um, and his grandparents have kind of a strange relationship with each other, a, a marriage based on nostalgia. So, so that's, I mean, not normally what I would think of as a reason for two people to get married. But if they're moving to the new world, I guess they would want that kind of cultural I, I, well, I think what's, what's going on there is that you, uh, you know, they meet, they're, they're immigrating from the same place. They don't really know each other very well when they're, they grew up near each other without really knowing each other well. And then they meet 
um, on the boat, you know, while they're crossing the Atlantic. And once isolated and, and in this kind of unstable, vulnerable position, this uh, this common reference point of both coming from the same hope town kind of brings them together, and then they end up just staying together, and that's how they get together. So they maintain this bond, um, even though, uh, at least from the the narrator's perspective, it's it's kind of a, a dubious bond. The narrator, I think, is is rather dubious of of origins, but also kind of fascinated by them. It's there's like a conflicted thing with origins going on there. Right. And the theme within the first one of the, of the empty, the house on wheels, Mm -hmm. which takes on its own kind of character uh, for the narrator is I think very fascinating. And it seems to me very appropriate again for November because there's something about uh, memory and how it's utilized in the story, which is very autumnal. Um, so it, when he talks about finally coming upon the house on wheels um, and inside, and the, the step dissolves under his feet, so there's this sense of decay and age and being outside of a time. Um, and looking in and seeing these papers fluttering mm-hmm. around, almost like the dry leaves that are fluttering around the outside, but it having more kind of meaning. Um, to me, it, was, it, it just seemed very, very kind of autumnal. And I also think fall lends itself to this kind of story of looking back and remembering because it's a transitional kind of season. Um, you, have, you have the decay of the, of the spring and the summer, and then in between that is the dead of winter. So mm-hmm. there's the creation and then the death, and all you have in the middle is the fall. So that's kind of the place that memory also sort of tends to serve, I find. And then it has the symbol of the woman, he kind of thinks of inside and mm-hmm. I've also sort of associate women more in in they age in a sense of seasons much more so I think than men tend to you have the the young child and then the woman of marrying age and then the woman who creates children and then the, like the crone oh, interesting. so I think that her being associated with fall and with time and with memory of this house it it all interconnects very well I think the image is really cool yeah, I think that they're both. Um, I'm, it's interesting that that you captured on that. I think that um, I think the the word autumnal might even be in uh, that first text. I don't remember, but uh, I think that there's uh, both stories are kind of uh, have this uh, organic, natural quality. One with this kind of water that's kind of overtaking uh, the structure, and that the the narrator kind of circles around is always circling. There's like right. a circular nature it's like to that. An, it's like an eternal water sort of approach mm-hmm. to the memory house in the second one. Whereas mm-hmm. the first one, it's, it's much more kind of seasonal and in stages. And, and the link is, I think, approached differently. But, I mean, with memory, it's so, it's so fluid. You could come... You could you could play with that theme in any number of ways. Oh yeah, no, it's it's very rich. I mean, most of what we have is is memory because the the present is is very is very hard to to grasp. But I think maybe b- different people associate different things with memory. And when you're talking about memory, you can be talking about um, more generally trying to get into uh, some sort of unconscious space. Which I think when I think of the house. Uh, and memory houses, I guess what I would think of is that the house is kind of a metaphor for, for your head and what's mm-hmm. kind of, what's, you know, what's up there in the attic or what's down there in the basement and this kind of like yeah. gothic house as a, <laughs> as a way of going back into these like uh, repressed world of, of nightmare or desire, things like that. Yeah. What's that? What's that film um, with John Cusack, but it's always referencing the other actor and he, he can become... Oh, being John yeah. Malkovich? Yes, and then when he's going into John Malkovich's memory and it's all of these different bizarre and terrifying scenes. Yes, yes, yes. It was just a great movie. Being John Malkovich is awesome. I just saw that again recently. Um, yeah. Which also, it, it begins or it, it sets itself up in this kind of like psychoanalytic framework or that's like often how it's studied. Um, and you can you can make that as technical and boring as, as you want, but I, I think that there's, there's something really... Um, appealing about um the house as a metaphor for for things that are in inside your head that you can't always access especially because the the house is also associated with like the childhood home and your first encounter with with spaces and how those spaces can can change over time so yeah the yeah the season i mean i think yeah the autumn is is a nostalgic month because you you 
just the leaves in themselves, you see kind of what they used to be. And there's this sense of things slowly dying, but you can still see them there. There's a, there's a certain way. Right. It, 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 it invites itself to, to thinking about the past, but also kind of emphasizes that the past is definitely in the past. And, and there's all number of but also in you the present make between right between the past uh, and, and like the house metaphor uh, mm-hmm. for one's past, and then also the the seasonal one. And so I, I was definitely um, I enjoyed how those two were intertwined within the first story as an exercise in uh, a story on memory. As far as the second one, I it 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 approached it in a different way which was also uh quite beautiful in in instances of um although i was very confused for much of it as to exactly what was going on i don't know but maybe that was part of the the style of the prose because i mean memory is so kind of fluid it's, it's a text that i've even um changed the order the initial order uh, to make it somewhat more linear than it and than it would appear to be um, in the original in this in this compressed version, let's say mm-hmm. it's uh, no it's definitely been rearranged to actually try to mimic a certain progression. But I think that the the idiosyncrasies of the narrator and how strange I you don't know I kind of imagine him as like a, a strange little fellow. Um, yeah, he's definitely out of this fascination on the potentially morbidly obese Mrs. Margaret's. I <laughs> have trouble identifying, but I liked it because it made me think of one of the other things that I have, have read about memory, which is whenever you remember something, you're not remembering what happened. You're remembering the last time you remembered it, mm-hmm. which it's all about how things become steadily more and more distorted as you look back at them, um, which I mean – on the one hand, gives you more of an appreciation for people who write their own biographies. But it's, it's, it's the natural progression where or if there's like an occasion in your life that you remember constantly, each time mm-hmm. you're thinking about it, you're not thinking about that event. You're thinking about the last time that you thought about the event. So and whatever, it evolves. Maybe, That's it evolves. Right, right. And however, it's linked to your emotions, your personality, or when you're remembering it or whatever, it's becoming slightly more and more distorted. Um, which I find fascinating with kind of the evolution or, or, or different aspects of the different entities of Mrs. Marguerite and how it's surrounded by water and the never changing vegetation and then the circling of an island. So there's tons of different kind of messages and themes there that you could explore. Yeah, the memory, I mean, it's, I think there's this sense of, of, of it constantly retreating, which is why it, there's always something a little bit sad. Like, but at the same time, it, it's such a, a creative process. And because you, if you remember what you remember and you're, in, you know, you're inflecting that image that you've retained every time with like a different interpretation, um, kind of like copies of, of a photograph, if you want to use that metaphor or, um, or just an image that you go back to and is a little bit different every time. Like um, it becomes interlaced with like desire. You remember what you want things to be like. And so memory is often a projection of, of fantasy as much as it is of, you know, a trauma or any other kind of thing. So it always, it always gets kind of interlaced and murky. And I think water is one of the most, I mean, I've always found anything that has to do with water totally fascinating. And there, it's always been a a very um, appealing metaphor too for like, um mystery and the unconscious and what lies below the surface that you can kind of see but not and this kind of uh weird viscosity that both of them have uh but in the first one i think that uh the there's the photographic thing and what what manifests itself more overtly especially with the sound is like the leafiness Mm -hmm. but the actual process of of the photographs is is about you know layers of liquids being put on top of each other. That's true. So I honestly, I was paying way more attention or trying to pay way more attention to the sound and your tone of voice when you're reading these two stories. But I would not be surprised if having the the sound of the leaves versus the water in the background is what really lent me towards the images that I gravitated towards and the metaphors within the stories. That's actually extremely interesting. I I don't even know this. And they say that's what makes a really great film soundtrack. And I know that both you and I, are really drawn to soundtracks is if it's really, really good, you don't even notice the music. Yeah. Or it's it, the music almost, yeah, it's, it's, 
Well, if you ask how I would even evaluate a soundtrack, I mean, that, that's, that's tricky. Uh, I don't know if I, I think I like to notice it, uh, but at the same time, they're, they're, they're like, it adds this whole dimension. It's like turning something that's two-dimensional into something that's three-dimensional. Right, but it can't be a detractor. It has to be something that intertwines, and then they both support the other. They can't yeah. be... They they have to they have to intertwine. They have to But together. not manipulate. Like I don't obviously it's super cheesy if this is like this is the music where you feel sad and this is the music where you feel scared. Like those kinds of tropes you wanna, <laughs> That's you wanna no, avoid. But they can be obvious in, in really great ways, which is why I um I really love the Jaws soundtrack. This is on a completely side note, but if you ever listen to everybody knows the iconic Jaws mm. music is like it's the shark but if and and that's all it really plays in the film but if you listen to the full soundtrack of that particular composition it starts out with these images where you're just picturing like a bunny frolicking through a field first like the level of innocence with that's captured by the music is so cartoonishly like idyllic and it's well, then, no, but that, that totally makes sense because the the it starts out with Jaws, but really it's about the reaction of this idyllic little town called Amity or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they re the, a lot of the movie insists on this like kind of serene, perfect surface, and then what lies beneath, right? Right. So the monster has a a, a relationship or an expression of like problems that are like within the town. Uh, so it's interesting that the music would play up that like like happy innocence because that's what the film too, is trying to no to comedic extremes if you listen to it so i would recommend it, it makes me chortle it really does well but, speaking of speaking of soundtrack so i uh and we'll, we'll link this back in i'm sure eventually but uh on thursday i saw film glass yes Ooh. and we'll mm -hmm. have like a sound effect for that at some point when i get really advanced because we do it all the time <laughs> tangents are great i love tangents hmm the best but you saw Philip Glass. I did. I saw Philip Glass. Do you know Philip Glasses? No. He's I'm a composer. <laughs> He's a composer. He's been around for quite some time. I think he since maybe the seventies or late sixties even. Um, so he's got to be in his eighties. Um, he's a he's a pianist primarily, uh, but he he's composed a number of soundtracks, including the, of piano solos, including um, I think the most recent is The Hours, which is so the Virginia Woolf piece he does the soundtrack for so since you're into virginia wolf you might i'm almost finished with orlando by the way ah uh, we should talk about that later tangent uh, on tangent yes i want to i want to ask you about that but not too much because i also so it's so good it's oh, so, good. so good well imagine a man who's who is tasked with making the soundtrack for a movie based on a virginia wolf novel if you will so they, they tend to be these beautiful uh piano solos where you'll have kind of like very simple melodies and then they'll they'll accelerate or decelerate in in, in speed in different ways and you envision landscapes or or i think lots of like natural moving and they're and they're very energetic and very melancholic at the same time or alternately but when i saw him so I, it was it was a totally amazing experience because he comes out on stage and he's this kind of gruff, uh, formal, professorial looking type. He's wearing like a sweater vest and he's like sort of this Jewish intellectual with this New Yorkish accent. I think he's born in Baltimore. Um, but uh, and so he gives this kind of like dry. It's witty and it, it's it's amusing, but like a very dry um, explanation of the piece. And then he plays and it's just like you just melt. Like you're just overwhelmed with all the feelings. You feel all the feelings. And then he gets to get all, the feels, all the feels. All the feels. I can't. <laughs> you feel all the feelings. I'm not even kidding. And, and you I become mean, a ragamuffin and just go. Ugh. Uh, <laughs> like a ragamuffin cat. <laughs> not to be confused with an actual ragamuffin or a ragdoll. Yes, <laughs> this is sort of an ab ab adaptation. Mm. Um, but anyway, so he's a uh, he's a beautiful soundtrack uh, composer. I think certain certain composers are great for giving you a sense of an entire world and how that world might function. And if you can do that as one composer, that's pretty cool. Usually they pick different songs. So if I could have played Philip Glass for this, I would. But uh, but no no free copyright. Um, but yeah, so yeah, the the, the photography uh, thing I think in the um, in the first one and in, in the uh, in the original version is is perhaps more prominent, and then you get a, a sense of of the technical processes that that were involved in in actually making a photograph. 
um, because the 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 um the wee little house on wheels is a dark room oh I traveled around I did not. I, I saw that it had it had photography on like mm -hmm. painted on the side, but I was picturing like an old gypsy caravan, and I never thought of them as being, it, like dark rooms. Yeah, it's what it looks like. It's mentioned very briefly at the beginning, and then again right before. But again, they're they're very fluid stories, so picking out details can sometimes be hard. But it's it's um, actually a it's a movable dark room. Okay. And so yeah. the the processes and then all the images that go. We should stop saying processes cute. though. Because that makes me think of prosthetics, 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 really. prosthesis. Well, like, I mean, there's a lot of words that start with pro, so I don't know what you're going to do. I mean, it's, it's just a really common topic. No, they just sound really similar to me for some reason. Every time you say it, I'm thinking of like somebody with a like, really advanced. No, I'm thinking about people with like really a electronically advanced prosthetics, prosthesis, prosthetics. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of that movie with Harrison Ford. The fugitive, because of that one killer who has a prosthetic arm. Every time you say processes. Well, you know it's funny because uh, Harrison Ford is actually the author. No. <laughs> 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 Boom! That's you got it. I, mean, I hate to give it away, but you just, you, you just, you just, you that you guessed it by. I'm not surprised. <laughs> there's a south park character who's a doctor and basically he just operates by like totally random association to get to like really obvious conclusions and that's um you could be that character i would be that character so i'm going to guess now because that's a good that's a good turnaround build up i'm glad i could incorporate prosthetics into this um the one thing that was completely unrelated um even less so than uh what was his name philip glass Glass. Little glass is related to everything. Uh, also, there were there were sheets of glass in the first one. There, there's, um, there's a glassy there, there's and the glass. second one. There were sheets of glass in the second one as well. There's the glass, the stained glass windows. So, mm -hmm. uh, yes. And you know, water can be reflective, as is glass. So, there's. That. You know, the glass does not move. I thought it did. It's like a myth. In chemistry glass. classes, they used to say that you know that they. Um, Glass actually is kind of um, like the molecules move around and it actually is more like a liquid. Um, but that's not true. Really? Which, but I love that image. I was, so, I was so depressed to learn that that's not true. Well, what I love about glass, in fact, perhaps my second favorite thing to stained glass lampshades is that if lightning will strike sand with a high enough temperature, it creates glass. Sand oh, that's where the where glass comes from. That's true. Mm -hmm. The first occurrences of glass is when lightning hits sand. There's a beautiful uh, little tiny museum in this uh, town in Romania. Um, I think it's Shishwara is the name, but it could be a different one that has a shorter name. Um, but there, it has a, a display of the different medieval and like early Renaissance guilds that operated in in this Romanian town. Mm. In like the 1500s, let's say, so early Renaissance, and uh, so before the Baroque. Like, yes, pre-Baroque, post-medieval. You follow me. We were at we're at the same century. That's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, sure. Early, yeah, early modern is always like 1500s, I guess. It, so anyway, it has like the a displays of the ga the glassmakers guilds and the kind of secrets that they had to keep. And um, it's like the early Freemasons. Yes, something like that. There's like this sort of mystique around it, but the objects in themselves are very simple and, and luminous. And kind of brightly colored. So, no, anyway. that's very awesome. Glass associations. It's true. It's true. Although that was not so much incorporated into the the memory um, images of these stories. So I shall leave it alone for now. And guess which one of these you wrote? And without giving any explanation, I'm going to guess that you wrote the first one. <laughs> because it's seasonal. Because it's so autumnal, and you have a pumpkin candle behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I did write the first one. Uh, so, Score! well, yeah. It doesn't have to be complicated. Do you have a reason? <laughs> no, that was it. Yeah. It was, it was with the pumpkin candles. <laughs> this story it makes me think candle. of candle. It was the candle. I, I was like, I see this candle. She totally went to Starbucks and ordered uh, a white girl, white chocolate pumpkin mocha venti <laughs> and wrote 
wrote the story about it Ireland. Is. Ireland so cool. <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah. So basically, if I hadn't played leaves in the background, you wouldn't have guessed it. Is what you're telling me? No, um, actually, I thought that was very clever that you just uh, incorporated two different um, random noises. Um, I, I, I thought that you were you were leveling the playing field because we've talked about how the more thought seems to be put into one um, story in in terms of like musical accompaniment is an indication of which one you wrote. So I, I feel like you really leveled it and we're, and we're, we're getting very tricky. So I couldn't use that at all. That I mean, it's tricky funny. too, because like, to be honest, like, now that I, um, I have less time than I did when we first started this project. Yeah. And so just writing a story has become like a huge feat. And I, I've had to minimize my competitive aspects, unfortunately. Um, although I don't know. I, I don't know if I, I give too many too many tells, but uh, yeah. So the um, the second story um, and the second story is what I I wanted to write a story that had the same tone as the story. It's one of my favorite authors in the world um, from Uruguay. His name is mm. Felizberto, which is mm. an unusual name. Felizberto, like Phyllis Bert. Felizberto Hernandez, and um, this he writes better than Spanish than what in English. Uh, most things do. <laughs> Those damn romance languages. <laughs> I know, right? It's just, it just kind of flows off the tongue. Um, but this one is called the uh, La Casa Inundada, The Flooded House. And it's it's a very long, short story um, that has this kind of circular uh, uh, pattern, if you will, that I, I kind of rearranged slightly. Um, but it, it's, it's pseudo-autobiographical. Uh, but, uh, I mean, yeah, basically it's, it is what is, it happens in the story, you know, that He's a, he's a writer and he's kind of down on his luck and he doesn't have a job or money and and so he gets this gig um, working for this you know this eccentric fat woman who uh, thinks that the water talks to her or is sentient or something like that and so he's talking about the things that emerge in him and uh, in response to that scenario so that's the that's the gist of the actual narrative I think that the beauty of it is overwhelmingly in how he describes it and in certain in certain metaphors. He, he's very good at um, humanizing uh, objects or, or things. So um, it works much better in Spanish where things have genders. So like water, it would be her. Of course. So, so you can, it, it just lends itself. And he really captures on, on that aspect, I think, quite a lot. But he's always kind of interested in um, in memories and, and desires and um, extremely eccentric uh, behavior. And there's, a, there's an overwhelmingly nostalgic autumnal quality to a lot of his work as well that, that I really like. So it's, it's this great mix of kind of playful absurdity and then it's got this philosophical twist. And and then it's it's sort of overwhelmingly uh, melancholic. So um, I mean, it's I think maybe if I'd made it shorter, you would have been able to linger a little bit more on some of the some of the comparisons that uh, that he makes. But it, um, it's 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 just quite it's quite brilliant to to read. And I especially like the the image of a flooded house. I've always liked strange houses. Like I like Mrs. Yeah. Mr. Popper's penguins mm -hmm. or Mrs. Higgledy Piggledy's upside down house. I love that. Even the borrowers because you're it's a tiny house with a yes. house. Yes, mm -hmm. which I was just talking to mom about that actually. And my, my my similar love, which is also in Feliz Better for for tiny things. There's a way that he has of, of kind of like capturing on something that's receding or in kind of weird circular uh, futile things that he finds kind of some some sort of deeper meaning in. There's a lot of circularity I've noticed in, in Feliz you know, Better. Even the boxcart children had kind of strange houses. I love the boxcart children. I, I had a pretend paper doll box card children uh, set that I played with obsessively for, for And the Trevor years. of the Swan, he lived on a pond. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that one I don't think it was. It's kind of a water swan, house. So. But it's yeah. a water house. Yeah, but the, the absurdity is not as, as, as pronounced there. But, but he's, a, he's a house professional of musician swan. Or uh, Howl's, Mo uh, Howl's Moving Castle. Yes. I'm also a great... Uh, and... and Spirited away, the, the big bathhouse. Again, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I like this. Again, I loved the image of, of a of a bedroom in which all the walls were covered with uh 
with water cans that were all falling into each other and then you have these candles floating around and this big thing uh, on the top that's glass. There's a lot of transparency that's also distortive. It's like a false transparency kind of like like memory. So I, I just found, the, uh, I find the the tone and the the uh, the environment or the images just very, very arresting. Um, I think it comes across more perhaps when you read him. I think he is more meant to be read perhaps than than listen to well that was that was another thing so i would say and 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 honestly it was not the candle that that caused me to think that you wrote the first story (laughs) i should clarify so i think that the the tone was was pretty clearly kind of morose and and introspective in the first one whereas the second one it had more it had a different kind of energy to it but the energy was kind of tapered by the tone in which you were reading it. So the way that you read them was similar, and it almost it almost sounded the same. But then I was thinking, okay, if I was reading as as you were speaking, I was imagining reading it, and that's why mm-hmm. I, I got that the energy was maybe a little bit different. And then there was the phrase in the first one, um, and the narrator is referring to his grandparents and his relationship with them. And he said how he was pretty sure that they loved me in a devout and tribal way, which is something I can completely imagine you saying (laughs) (laughs) about your grandparents. No, I I do have a – and and I I love my family very much, but I I, I, am critical of of this idea that just because – a family like people are related to you that you're supposed to feel certain feelings for them and i think that there's this complex uh relationship to one's origins that i, I find really interesting yeah, too particularly, particularly with the irish yeah so the irish uh, um as well the irish um i chose ireland um well i have i've never really said anything for some reason and a friend of mine once said this uh years ago but um you know or he said something like, you know, Uruguay's relationship to Argentina is a little bit like Ireland's to England. Um, so I, the, the, the second one being an Uruguayan story, I chose Ireland for, for the first mm-hmm. one as kind of a, a, a English-speaking counterpoint. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, and you'll see, uh, there's a, a photo of a... Um, so I re- I was, I'm researching how uh, photos used to be made for a project that I'll eventually do about spiritist photography mm-hmm. and like how that actually worked. And so how like... Um, collodion photography worked which is basically what they used from 1850 to like 1880 ish and it's like this complex process that involves like silver nitrate and all these uh, different plates but in the course i came across this photo because one of the questions or one of the issues with it was that after you take the photo onto this plate you have very little time to develop it and make it into a print before it like dissolves so you have to work really really quickly and so, it, and you need all these apparatuses or apparati or whatever. Like you need the you need the paper, and it has to be all prepared. And you need all these different liquids, and you need a dark room. And like, how do you do that when you're like on the field, right? Or like traveling? So there was this image of a of an Irish. Uh, uh, that's what Wikipedia told me. <laughs> All these stories come from Wikipedia of mm-hmm. a kind of like a like a, it looks like a little caboose or like a little gypsy caravan, um, and it just says such and such photographer, and it was a portable traveling dark room. Oh, wow. uh, which I thought was a really a, a cool image and idea, and I mean, f- memory and photography are, are obviously um, very natural. Yes, they have a very natural kind of relationship. <sighs> so anyway, so that's uh, that's where, but that's that's Felizberto. I, I really recommend him if you uh, if you like this sort of mix of like humor and 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 nostalgia or humor and melancholy. Um, he was he was also a pianist. Um, I have an article published about him actually. Um, he, uh, he he has like these really absurd, difficult stories, um, but then he has uh, I think like more maybe slightly more accessible ones. Um, no novels; they're all kind of like these short texts. But the first texts he published were like the size of a passport, and he just published like a few of them in like these tiny little towns. Ooh. And it was called a, a book without covers. That was the name. I like that. I like that yeah. a lot. Actually. It's like this this fascination with the miniature and one of and also with insanity. I mean, he he, he was probably somewhere on the spectrum, as oh, you would say I'm, now. As as many as many writers tend and, to yeah. be, yeah, and for obviously reasons. reasons. Yes, but there's a, like because he's a pianist and because of the insanity, a lot of his stories, and I realized it reading this one that I hadn't noticed before, have these like kind of roaring sounds in the background. And there's a late one that's really well known called um, 
uh, Las Hortensias, which is about a guy who makes giant dolls. And there's this machine like whirring in the background the whole time. So that sets a certain like, uh, I mean, you could imagine if you were just listening to a machine in the background all the time, the kind of t- tone that that would, that that would set. So I think yeah, there's a certain dementia yeah. in the, the kind of the constant background noise there too. Oh my God, that's incredible. 